have a local touch from our eyes, which will touch the spark tears, um, as well as music from the Raging Grannies, which will be awesome. So, yeah, I'm going to holler to those guys. Wait, what? Those, wait, excuse me. Um, we will also uh, have trash and compost bins over there in the corners, as well as uh, peddlers for the uh, recycling system, and greatly appreciated. There's a donation stand for the food on the table over there, and a at the registration desk as well. And uh, Susan uh, Verge, I believe her name is pronounced, is somewhere over here, and she uh, will be speaking momentarily, so for round of applause. In today's New York Times, we see confirmed why we're all here today. Climate change is the greatest challenge of our time. And that's something that one of the scientists who's chairing the UN panel on climate change had to say, along with the fact that, in his opinion, he says, in short, climate change threatens our planet, our only home. This latest report from scientists around the world makes it clear that human created climate change is an unfolding catastrophe and the time is running out. But we still have a window of time to avert this disaster and that's why we're here today. Three organizations, Arise for Social Justice, Springfield Area, NAACP, and Climate Action Now Western Mass, along with 40 co-sponsoring organizations and a whole volunteers came together to create this event. Climate change affects everyone, but climate change has a disproportionate impact on communities like Springfield and Holyoke. That's why we're here in Springfield today, to help build a climate justice movement that connects the impassioned activists working to protect life on this beautiful planet with the great movements for social and economic justice. A climate justice movement in Western Mass that reflects and honors the diversity and the beauty of the people and the region that we live in. So, hey, it is, it is a very wonderful place to live, but we want to keep it that way. I'm here to welcome you on behalf of Climate Action Now Western Mass. Climate Action Now is a grassroots organization born a year ago after the first Climate Action Conference we held in Amherst. A lot of exciting work has come out of that conference, and we have, uh, we have tables all here today that are reflecting lots of the fabulous works, work that's happening. And I want to point out, um, where's Darcy and our folks over there? We have a statewide group of people working to divest our state pension funds out of the fossil fuel industry. It's really exciting stuff. And they're over there. And another outcome of last year's climate conference is that we became the Western Mass Center of Climate Action Now for 350 Mass, which is a growing statewide network of climate activists that are working to stop fracking and to stop the tar sands pipeline. And 350 Mass folks are there. Action Now announcements list, which is very low email, we promise. So anyway, we welcome all of you to get involved, and we need all of you to get involved. And I just want to say, for me personally, that organizing this conference has given me so much hope that a group of people, most of whom didn't even know each other a few, a few months ago, going to get that feedback? Thank you. Uh, is the feedback better? Yeah. That a group of people, most of whom did not even know each other, came together around a shared vision. And in this work, we experienced what it's like, we truly did, what Martin Luther King calls the beloved community. It's been a really beautiful experience. And I'd like all the organizers of the conference to stand up, because it's been a long haul, and people have done a lot of work. Of late 
last night and at the crack of dawn making pumpkin, banana, and zucchini breads that are all back there. So let's thank them as well. Some of them are also doing workshops. We also have 40 co-sponsoring organizations. I think that's really significant, the broad range of support for this event. And a lot of them are tabling, so please stop by and visit folks at the table. I also want to thank the folks who so generously funded us. The Mark and Nathan Fund for Social Justice, the Richard and Judy Stein Endowment Fund for Sustainability, and that's Dick Stein, Dick Bowden, who's also been on the committee, Green and Grace Green Church, the NAACP, Springfield Department of Health and Human Services, Margaret Bella Jonas, and the Westfield Concerned Citizens, along with Panera and Hungry Ghost Bread, who donated food. So, in conclusion, as we get on to the rest of the program, I just want to say a couple more words. That, that we're really hoping that today, that it's, it's such an important thing to have a time when we can all come together like this. I really think of it as a sacred space where we can really be together and be in community and focus on what's important. So today is a day to learn, to connect, to be inspired by each other, to envision the future we want for our children and our grandchildren, and also to eat and to listen to music, to laugh, to get to know each other, to work together to figure out our next steps as we build a united, unstoppable people's movement for climate justice. So thank you all for being here today, and I think it's going to be a really exciting day. I hope you stick around until the end. And now I'd like to introduce next uh, Michael Ann Busley from, she's the director of Arise for Social Justice. She is a tireless fighter, 30 years at Arise, never gives up the fight. And at the same time that she's fighting the fight for social justice, she's helping folks who don't have a place to live to find homes. She's yeah. meeting basic needs that should be met by our government. She's a one-stop government uh, social transformation, social change organization. Okay, this is fantastic. I'm looking around at the people here. I'm just thrilled. Um, there's certainly some people I think are still coming, including a great performer, Sheldon Gaynor, and if he gets here on time this morning, we will stop everything so he can do a couple spoken words. Um, so if I suddenly stop speaking and go, you're late, but come on, you know, that, that's, that's what's going on. Um, when Arise was approached only about three months ago to ask if we wanted to do the next Climate Justice Conference in Springfield, I was thrilled. I mean, Arise is not the kind of organization I think that people automatically think about when they think about working on environmental issues. And it probably wouldn't have been in our playbook either, except about five years ago when we worked to stop a biomass plant. And we heard all these good reasons why we needed to stop this plant. Um, it's not carbon neutral. It's going to cut down our forests. Um, you know, it's the wrong direction to go in for renewable energy. All of those things, that's true. But when people in Arise really get engaged, when people in Arise are struggling every day for housing, for freedom from police brutality, um, for the myriad of social justice issues we deal with. But we live in a city where almost one out of four kids has asthma, and a city where there's an awful lot of poor people that can't afford air conditioning, that suffer through heat waves, that live in drafty apartments that they can't keep warm in the winter, and they're spending money there. So we've gone through this process of education, it is not over by any means, about why poor people should care about environmental justice issues. And now, why do we care? Because if we don't get it together, we'll all be homeless. We'll all be homeless. This planet is our home. And if we can't pr preserve and protect this planet, it won't just be the low-income people that are wondering where we go next. So I'm so grateful that Climate Action Now did approach us. 
I'm so thrilled that the local NAACP um, was willing to jump in. And I said, I'm going to find us a good keynote speaker. Now, how can I find us a good keynote speaker? So I depend on Google, of course. I went to Google. I typed in a few keywords. Um, environmental justice, people of color. Um, you know, just various search terms. Well, it didn't take me too long to go, there she is. This is the person I want. Um, part of this came about because as I'm looking up her, what she's done, everything that she's been involved in, two of the words that jumped right out at me were, oh, she worked in the Boston shelter system. She promoted housing first. Housing first being a very key concept for those of us that arise. Um, don't mythologize us. Don't tell us about our personal problems when we're homeless. Get us in housing. We'll deal with everything else later. It'll be a lot easier. So those are the first words that jumped out. Then I found out she was a founder of Women of Color United. Now, I know this group. I know that they have really been the first that I know of, organization to really jump in and say environmental justice is about us. Um, and then, go on just to, oh my gosh. Woo, it's <laughs> So, um, I think I, I am gonna introduce Sheldon. Um, but then I said, okay, this is the person. Now I know you're building up to a great round of applause for our keynote speaker, who is now the um, coordinator for the National NAACP Climate Justice Initiative. So let's have that round of applause first, Jackie Patterson. Sheldon Gaynor, and then we'll have Jackie on. Then you'll hear a few logistical pieces of information about room changes for workshops, and then we'll be good to go. So, Sheldon Gaynor, mass incarceration. You ready? Okay. Excuse my tardiness. I'm Sheldon Gaynor, um, as I said before. Uh, I thank everybody that came out for um, climate control and uh, climate justice. Um, I'm born and raised in Springfield, and um, climate is definitely something that, that really needs to be raised awareness on because um, I was born with asthma, so being in the environment that I am in, um, it, it, it causes a lot of stress on my breathing. And um, uh, I'm definitely for this, um, you know, renewable energy and clean energy and agriculture. And just being able to, you know, be very resourceful with the things that we have, especially as recycling. Um, I recycle at my home, and I encourage anybody that's not doing it now to, you know, do it today. Um, every day when I walk in, um, down my street or around my city, when I see trash, I pick it up. I make sure, you know, to maintain, you know, a beautiful city. So, um, can I get a round of applause for everybody that put this together? You know, even from my I'm gonna do a poem that's, um, I, I was trying to, you know, get a, get a, um, you know, agricultural poem going, but I really, I really couldn't, you know, come to, you know, it's when I get it, I got it. But um, this poem I'm going to share with you is actually uh, for the women of, of the world that are, have a very, very deep impact in how the world is shaped and how the world is 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 kept uh, kept alive and um, going. And this one is uh, dedicated to uh, my girlfriend, but. Um, just basically, in general, women's presence. <clears throat> like lightning and thunder penetrating the sky, catching eyes or catching lies, you are more than what appears. Much more than stars contributing to the galaxies feeding the constellations, for you are more than a woman. Just listening to your heartbeat creates an indescribable description, something of unnatural depiction like 
a Van Gogh Picasso, capturing the hot shape of a Renaissance art space. To put it in the simplest of terms, her blood pumps into the next generation, creating heroes and villains. The teachings of kindness are on her tongue, Proverbs 31, 26. But see, the wisest of women builds her house and with her own hands, lacking in sense, tears it down, Proverbs 14, 1. See, you are more than a woman. You are the other half of men. That's why men should hold steadfast to the wives and become one soul. For the quality of a woman's character is more precious than jewels and gold. For when I see you, I see the very blades of grass that give the Amazon its glory. A woman's teachings are more deep-rooted than legends and stories. See, for you are more than just a woman. You are my girlfriend, my mother, my friends, my family, my doctors, my exes that show me what I really want in life, the wives of my brothers that make their hearts rejoice, and my brother's keepers as well. Queens of Africa and England, empresses of the East, providers of the feast since hunters and gatherers knew how to eat. See, you give reason for nation to rise against nation. In your name, Helen of Troy, Cleopatra of Egypt, Bathsheba of Israel, Guinevere of England, and even the Sabines of Italy. See, women, you make men pigs, dogs, and wolves, but you also make us priests play things in sheep. So the next time someone degrades you, tries to sexually enslave you, remember, your beauty is of the most desired quality and possessions, and your spirit, your spirit cannot be measured by any quantity or bound, for you are more than a woman. Thank you. Get all that adjusting. Hopefully, I'll be able to. Okay, let's see. All right, good. Well, good morning. So good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I, so I thank our organizers, the, the Arise for Social Justice, Climate Action Now, and of course the NAACP Greater Springfield Branch, um, Greater Springfield Area Branch for having me, and it's a joy to be with you all. It's a testament to the commitment that Springfield has that, that this church has filled up with, with folks who are interested in, in talking about this topic all day. So it's particularly wonderful to be in the great state of Massachusetts because you do have a lot in Massachusetts compared to some other places in terms of kind of planet sustaining policies and practices, which is inspiring to me. Also great to be back in Massachusetts because as Michael Ann said, Michael Ann has been a, a gift over these months in preparing for this. She's gotten me, she sends me daily emails, you know, <laughs> with uh, subject lines. One more question, just one more thing. Last one, you know, <laughs> so she's been a joy though to get me stoked up for this, for this meeting. And just from, with her spirit, I definitely was inspired to come and join you all. But anyway, I, I, as uh, Michael Ann said, I do have a history in Massachusetts, having gone to undergrad school here at Boston University and um, for special education and working in the shelter system, the Pine Street shelter system, which I don't even know if it still exists. Yeah. But, okay. <laughs> yeah. So, and I also worked at a family shelter in, um, in Cambridge, Massachusetts called the Bigelow Family Shelter, which I don't think does exist. But it was run by the YWCA. So it's, uh, it's a joy to be back. So I want to talk with you a little bit about some of the issues that are, um, that are unfortunately standing in our way towards a progress towards a sustainable planet, but then also some of the hope and even the types of programs and, and policies that you have here. So I think we can all agree that we are on, a, and I'll let you know to yeah. I think we can all agree that we're on a uh, dangerous course in terms of how our relationship with nature and with, with uh, our natural resources, and, they, and also our relationship with others. Recently, I was asked to write uh, an essay um, with, to answer the question. There was a number of people who were asked that, to answer the same question, what does the earth require of us? And my response and, and the theme of my whole essay was harmony, harmony with each other and harmony with our natural resources. And unfortunately, I'll give some examples of ways that we're out of harmony and what that impact has been, and then the ways that we are moving towards harmony and how we need to, to uplift those, those um, practices. 
So, so what I want to talk with you about today is, is who's accruing kind of the, the debt that we're accruing towards the earth in terms of it, taking its natural resources. Who's paying the cost in addition to the earth in terms of people? Where do we go from here? Because as the title of my presentation indicates, I believe that there is another way. And it's going to take all of us working together to get the United States on that path in the world and, and be in sync with the rest of the world. So as we all know, we're living in a society that is more geared towards maintaining the wealth of the 1% than the health and well-being of the 99%. This has created a values proposition that has laid waste to, the, to any kind of earth-affirming policies and has relegated whole swaths of society to the expendable category, namely, as our uh, friend said, the, the 41, 47%. Fortunately, uh, we kind of dodged a bullet in terms of having an indoctrination of this notion of the freeloading 47% as being beneath contempt and outside of the government policy making and responsibilities. So we have kind of an albeit dim hope, but we have also have a lot to do in terms of turning the nation around and, and playing a, a more responsible role. So the question is, what are we going to do with this opportunity? Where, where, are, we, where are we now? How do we, how do we get here? And what's the cost that we're playing, paying as a result? So now we can start. <laughs> so we are, um, we are unfortunately, you know, in a situation where we've kind of commoditized our natural resources, whether it's, um, what, what, you know, in terms of the Earth's bounty of natural resources. We're um, in the next slide. Um, we are inundated with waste and um, excessive waste and consumerism, and in U.S. U.S. consumerism. Not only, oh, yeah, sorry. U.S. consumerism not only affects our carbon footprint, but because of our importing habits, it also affects the carbon footprint of other countries like China, um, our largest offshore production source. In the U.S., we generate over 356 billion pounds of waste every single year. What do we do with the with the majority of our waste? The two Bs: we either bury it or we burn it. There are over 100 waste burning um, mass facilities, biomass facilities in the U.S. And biomass incinerators emit uh, toxins like cadmium, arsenic, and lead into the atmosphere, as well as greenhouse gases like methane and dioxide. And this, uh, we also have over 3,000 active landfills and over 10,000 old municipal landfills. According to the EPA, even the most, uh, the best liners and wastewater collection systems will ultimately fail due to deterioration. And I know you have a number of landfills here, and then you also fought a struggle with uh, uh, an incinerator situation here in Springfield as well. So. And that's a picture of an incinerator as well. <laughs> so and this, unfortunately, is uh, some of the, the misguided thoughts that we have on what we need to be doing with our waste um, and, and some of our uh, faulty rationale. But, um, and unfortunately, a, a rather grim humor from this fellow, Chris Madden. He, there's kind of, you can't really see it very well, but it's like a four-headed bird that's being uh -huh. fed by the, um, <laughs> by the mother bird. So anyways, so, um, so what does our consumerism and our failure to institute safe ways of processing waste mean for families like the whole family in Dixon, Tennessee? In 2008, after noticing that there were excessive numbers of cancer cases and birth defects in their family, the whole family found out that they had been drinking water contaminated by the neighboring landfill with, that was contaminated with trichloroethylene, otherwise known as TCE, for years. And every single household either that depended on that water supply either had some form of cancer or some strange birth defect, which even to have like a whole block with a numerous birth defects is an, is an oddity in and of itself. And that, unfortunately, isn't an uncommon situation. That's just one that actually came to light and, and wasn't able to get on national news. So we have energy production processes that are killing us. We have uh, an oil and gas based system where this high school, the Savior Chavez High School in Houston, Texas, has five oil refineries within a 10 mile radius of the school. So you see that black smoke coming from these plants. Are, they're part of the daily ingestion of the students attending this largely African American and Latino school. We have uh, BP, the BP oil drilling disaster, which took the lives of 11 workers and destroyed the livelihoods and health of countless others, also eroding the culture of indigenous um, communities and other uh, and Vietnamese communities and others around the Gulf Coast. We have drilling for natural gas, which is contaminating the water supply of hapless neighbors with no power over this exposure. Yeah. And um, we have the potential to tie this, we have this, this is studies that are going on in terms of the tie between um, drilling for natural gas and even the increase in seismic activity or earthquakes that are going on. 
We have, um, we have now complicating this, we have nuclear facilities, some of which are built on earthquake fault lines. And most recently, you heard in Virginia where there was a scare regarding a plant that was potentially com compromised by the big quake um, a couple of years ago. And unfortunately, with all of these uh, nuclear facilities on earthquake fault lines, and then we have the increase in seismic activity, we're really looking at, at a potential imminent disaster, somewhat um, like the Fukushima situation. We have underground coal mining, fraught with risk of accidents and health effects like black lung, and we have the tops being blasted off of mountains, ruining landscapes and compromising the very foundations of nearby homes because, as we know, um, oh, yeah, oh, sorry, I should have come back that way, yeah. So we, we know pretty much that uh, the explosions are never a good thing, and the folks who are housing these, um, housing in the area with these mountaintops, they're not only losing their mountaintops, but the, the, the very force of the explosions is damaging the um, damaging the foundations of the homes of communities that are in these areas. Um, that it's causing sediment to get into the water supply. All kinds of complications from this um, this blasting off of mountaintops. So we have um, the NAACP did a report last year called Coal Blooded: Putting Profits Before People, looking at 3,378 coal-fired power plants um, in the most populous areas in the United States. We found that unfortunately these coal-fired power plants were disproportionately located in communities of color and low-income low income communities. And these these plants are spewing ar um, mercury, arsenic, lead, sulfur dioxide, nitrogen oxide, and of course they are the number one emitter of carbon dioxide, which is the number one contributor to climate change. But the different the different um, toxins that are coming from it um, affect communities in terms of we see the, the heightened rates of asthma, birth defects, heart disease, and lung cancer in the communities surrounding these plants. So. Um, this is actually an example. Sorry, <laughs> that's an example of someone who's actually fishing out of the waters near one of those plants, and with the water, the stuff that comes off into those uh, into those waterways, well, we know the types of risk. And unfortunately, communities of color are disproportionately subsistence subsistence fisher folks. Um, one of our executive vice presidents with the NAACP, um, Steve Hawkins, talked about when he was a child, and you know, rent would become due and money would become low, that he would go and fish out of the Hudson River up in this. It, this part, and w until one day when he pulled the, his um, catch out of the water and all the scales fell off the fish. So again, you know, that is unfortunately not an uncommon situation in terms of the contamination of these fish. We know that it, and, and even in these waters themselves, there's a mercury advisory there, but people who we talked to who were fishing out of the water said, you know, this is putting fish on our table, this is putting, you know, food on our table, and yeah, there's this mercury advisory, but we don't even know what that really means. We have, we don't get sick from this, but they don't really know what's really, you know, they, they might not necessarily be causing, um, tying that tingling they're feeling to the fish that they're eating every day because there's so many assaults in these communities. So then we also have things like the, um, the, the coal ash spill that happened, as you, you all remember, a couple, a few years ago with the TBA um, um, coal ash spill, which destroyed, um, next slide, is, yeah, it's destroyed homes and um, is still affecting people even, even now. So this is a Navajo family in Shiprock, Minnesota. They are surrounded by three coal-fired power plants within a 30-mile radius of their home. And they, um, literally every person in that family has um, a respiratory illness, either you know, the, the woman there in the wheelchair is on an oxygen machine. The kids are, um, have, have um, had asthma attacks that have sent them to their neighborhood, um, to their local healer. And, um, and the community, and, and they're just kind of one family in the community that's assailed by the various um, health conditions from being exposed to that level of, of toxins every day. So people say that if we don't change our habits, we'll be on the path to catastrophic climate change. For folks in the Northeast here, and in the Gulf especially, I'm sure that we would argue that the catastrophes have already arrived. We kind of talk like uh, the climate change is in the distant future, but we were really already seeing it here and now. So, um, I, yes, and um, unfortunately some folks still <laughs> tend to uh, deny the fact that uh, the climate change is here, but um, and unfortunately a lot of political reasons for that. So our next, uh, if we could queue up our CD, and, oh yes, sorry, thank you, um, we have, um, we have, these two young men who are part of this group called the Get Your Green. Oh, okay. Uh, sorry, well, well, we can just keep going. I'll tell you what they are. They are they, you can do the next slide. It's, it will, we need to take it strong. We need uh -oh. to take it strong. Okay, actually, I had to. Uh,
the lyrics for you, but you won't see them. Hopefully you can hear it and understand. out of Minneapolis and they are part of the school called the High School for Recording Arts which is a kind of a second chance charter school for kids who are having trouble in the, in the regular system and they decided that they were going to establish a school that taught kids through the arts so the, whether it's drama music and so forth and so this class is an environmental class um, and an environmental sciences class that they took and so they decided to start this group called the Get Your Green um, crew, I think, <laughs> and um, and then this was one of m multiple songs that they actually have on this CD. They have a couple of um, videos, um, amateur videos that they put together. If you look, at, if you look up, um, the URL is up there, but it's very complicated. If you Google "Get Your Green," as you see there, "Get Your Green." Um, SoundCloud climate control, then you can find it. Um, it'll, it'll come up pretty much as the first link. But um, anyway, I was very impressed when I when saw them when I spoke at an Earth Day event. But as you see, they're talking about this country's morals, laws, somebody help me find it. I'm not having that. Um, they're acting upon us, so that's the reason why we're acting back, protesting, lobbying, and so forth. Stop drilling for fossil fuels. They talk about specifically around how um, who's at risk, and they talk about the neighborhoods that are affected by the pollution and saying that the, this is happening because we're not in their category, meaning, meaning the folks who are making the decisions aren't necessarily the, the, the people, they're not the constituents of the people who are making the decisions, so they feel disenfranchised by the system. So um, I was very impressed by them and always like to, to play their music when I can because it's so compelling. I just apologize again for not having the visual for you um, of, the, uh, of the actual lyrics, but... So, um, so as as we know, we're seeing this increase in um, in extreme weather events. So we saw families from the Staten Island on the in the Jersey Shore, and the people who were rescued from the rooftops of New Orleans, um, who aren't here, and people who are, and then also people who aren't even here anymore to tell their stories. But we know that their families have their own stories of the legacy of of um, their enduring the pain of loss. So, um, and yeah. So this is uh, actually after, after the uh, the Katrina hurricane um, hurricane in Gulfport, Mississippi, and yeah, and then of course just images of tornadoes that we're seeing all too much. I know you had a tornado here, a few tornadoes here a couple years ago, 
And this is in um, Alabama, a city that, I mean, this is, I, I took this, I was in a, at a gas station looking over this area that used to have hundreds of homes, literally, and this was, and it, it was just flattened. Um, and this is what was left. Um, there were just a few cars, there were people just kind of looking through to try to find any mementos of their family. What, and, what did that? Pardon? What did that? That was a tornado. Yep. Oh, yeah, tornado. Um, and so we have kind of these impacts, and then we have both. both oh, I'm sorry. Um, back to that one. Um, we have both the ins inspiring um, stories around people being rescued and so forth. But then we have a story like this, which is an unfortunate one. That is the former site of uh, the Madison family, and that family was um, heard the hurricane, knew the tornado was coming, and this is in Alabama. They knew the tornado was coming, and they went to a uh, church that's just a few steps away next um, next door to, oh, yeah. Uh, they were, uh, that's okay. Uh, just a few steps away next door, and it was, the Madison family is an African-American family. They went to the church. It was a white church, and the white church was sheltering fam families in the church, but when they asked for shelter, they said, you know, they, they weren't sheltering people, and so they went back to the home, which um, was pretty demolished by the, uh, by the storm, and um, the mother and the two um, siblings perished, and only one remaining sibling survived. So again, it just kind of gets to, we'll, we'll talk about policy um, aims and so forth. We also need to look at our humanity and how we're living together, and again, that question of harmony. This is a family called the Clark family that, um, that also, their <laughs> Um, they had um, moved out to the to this area after living in the city in, Bur in Birmingham, and they saved up all their reti retirement funds to 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 establish this home eight months before the disaster. Then this it came through and swept their their house away. They were kind of crouched in the in the um, for, in the uh, hallway there, just kind of sheltering from the storm and. Um, between FEMA and uh, and their little house and um, home insurance that they had, they didn't have enough to rebuild or reestablish, so they're going back to the apartment and they just have to abandon this land because they can no longer live there after their whole kind of you know, savings and life being ready for this. So. Um, then we also had this is uh, this is in uh, Fort Gibson, Mississippi, a home. And the next um, slide gives you a sense of what that means for this community because that community is right next to this nuclear facility, the Grand Gulf Nuclear Station, and that 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 nuclear station was within feet, you know, several uh, dozen feet of being. Um, potentially breached by this by the flooding that took place. They had already had problems with this facility because A, they found that their um, infant mortality rates went up in the community when the, um, when the uh, facility went online, and they also were concerned about there not being ample escape routes in that community um, for, the, for if anything happened in, in, in the case of a nuclear incident. So they have, um, they had that concern, and then when this actually happened, they were both, um, that I, I encountered two situations. One where a church had said that they had applied for um, to be a, a shelter for with the Red Cross, but they were denied the ability to be a shelter for Red Cross. Then I found Red Cross, and it was kind of these two workers, like in their Red Cross vest and a table and two chairs in front of City Hall, compared to other places that had these disaster recovery centers and facilities like this. And I asked them why the disparity in terms of not having a full-fledged disaster recovery center. This is like an African American, very poor community, um, and they said, "Oh, you." You know, we have a policy against establishing real, you know, Red Cross services within seven miles of a nuclear facility. <laughs> so, so um, the tragedy, the tragic irony and injustice of the fact that they, as the helpers, couldn't even go in and do that, but yet people were living there in harm's way was, you know, was definitely telling. So. Um, so we also talk about the shifts in agricultural yields. Already African-American Latino families in particular, but also other low-income families are living in food deserts. Um, we, but right now we're having a situation where we have pavement that used to be rich with, you know, um, producing um, crops and so forth that's become like um, pavement as opposed to, you know, rich soil. We also have this, um, we also, we have these existing situations where we have people who live where the corner stores, they're more likely a source of food versus the supermarket. And then when you look inside these places, this is what we have in terms of comparative um, uh, food sources. So we have foods that are rich in 
so, uh, sodium, um, sugars, preservatives, and so forth. And then we have life-affirming, life-giving, life-preserving um, life foods that are in these supermarkets. And we have these shifts in agricultural yields that are resulting in, in drought and change our whole food supply, then we again will um, see this, you know, this bad situation getting even worse. We also have a sea level rise where um, the Maldives <laughs> decided in 2009 that they were going to have their cabinet meeting underwater, literally. Um, the president was like, this is what we're going to do. Because um, he really wanted to illustrate both to the country and to the world that this is the reality of what they're facing um, imminently because they are actually um, negotiating with neighboring islands because they're going to have to move within 20 years because of sea level rise. But it's not just the Maldives. Right here in the US, on the right is Thibodeau, Louisiana. And on the left is Kivalina Island in Alaska. Both are facing um, displacement due to sea level rise within 20 years. And so then how do we get here? Um, so we have a situation of profits over people. Um, this next slide kind of gives a sense of the amount of money that was spent on anti-regulatory lobbying in 2010 by the companies that run the, the biggest coal-fired um, coal generated um, electricity in the country. So $13 million spent by um, Southern Company, $13 million spent by Edison International, $10 million spent by American Electric Power, all on lobbying against regulations to make our, you know, to make the, the uh, facilities burn cleaner, and then also lobbying against even renewable portfolio standards, or renewable energy standards, or energy efficiency standards, so that we can actually reduce our, our um, these impacts. And so, not only do we see this in the regulatory system, but even in building our infrastructure. I was in Louisiana after Hurricane Isaac um, last year. Yeah, was it last year? Yeah. And um, I, I was watching CNN, and Julian, um, uh, I forget the name, Mrs. Malvo, Suzanne Malvo was interviewing um, Senator Mary Landrieu and asked her why it was that Plaquemines Parish didn't get the, their levees rebuilt, like, you know, um, in addition to places like New Orleans and so forth. And so they said, well, I asked, so she said, Senator Landry said, well, I asked the Army Corps of Engineers that same question. Why didn't you build up the levees here in Plaquemines Parish like you did in other places? And they said, well, we have a formula that we use to determine where we're going to build up the levees. And the formula is based on where there's going to be the most economic impact. True. Didn't matter how many people were there, who was there, anything like that, purely based on economic impact. So Plaquemines Parish, which is under the most risk for this kind of thing, they were hit by Hurricane Katrina, they were hit by, by this Hurricane Isaac and just everything in between because they're right in the, you know, the hurricane zone. But they don't get their levees built up because, you know, they're largely poor fisher folks and, and so forth, agriculturalists and, and so forth. So, again, so we really want to transition to the, this other way. <laughs> so hopefully we'll, we'll, our tone will go up from here. No more gasps of horror. <laughs> we'll just kind of move into a positive thing here. So we have... Um, so we have many options in terms of changing the way that we're, we're doing. In the last election campaign season, we had $150 billion spent on ads promoting dirty energy policies that pollute our community. The biggest single contributor was uh, reportedly the Koch brothers, whose holdings have been responsible for harming communities and the planet <laughs> in the US. <laughs> so, um, so we really can have a situation where all rights matter, including those of Mother Earth on whom we depend for our very existence and vice versa. So um, the um, administration has committed to advancing a clean energy standard of 80% renewable energy by 2050, and we should hold them accountable for that. Um, yeah, this is this is little known kind of conversation that happens, but they have promised to put us on track to reducing emissions by reducing emissions by 80% by 2050, and we have to hold them accountable for that. They've committed to developing a climate action plan, which they have, um, and we must hold them accountable for the tenets of that climate action plan. However, even within the climate action plan, there's some challenges in terms of some of this all of the above strategy around our energy, so we need to also hold them accountable for making the climate action plan a justice-based plan. So, from Oregon, um, from Portland, Oregon, to right here in Massachusetts, we have communities establishing ways of, of doing this better. Um, next slide. You know, we have people switching to, you know, to mass transit. We have people um, transitioning to wind energy. Um, and we have people switching to, uh, to really looking at um, solar power at homes and businesses. This is actually a friend of mine in Lancaster, Lancaster, Pennsylvania, 
whose whole home is, is powered by, um, by solar, and he also has all of his heating and cooling through a geothermal system. Fortunately, Pennsylvania has great policies around this that allow you know them to him to get tax rebates for that. He had, and they also have the net metering, which Massachusetts has as well, where um, the the excess energy that he gets from that solar system, because he doesn't use all the energy that he he pulls in from the sun. Um, that excess energy is able to sell it back to the grid for the same amount that he would have bought it for through this policy called net metering. So we have churches. This is a church in Alabama that has uh, solar panels, and this is the batteries that they, that they store it and use it on Sunday morning and otherwise. And um, we have different ways that we are taking action as we move forward. So we have to educate ourselves, which you're all doing here and in, in many different ways, I'm sure. Um, and the first step is to is what you're do is what you're doing in terms of pulling together these kinds of meetings and so forth. We um, have forums like this, which is an EPA hearing on um, carbon pollution standards, where we have to make sure that we're in there making our voices heard, ju justice-based voices on these, on so the decisions are made based on justice-based principles, not just on um, on economics, for example. We need to make sure that community-based research is being prioritized. So whether it's historically indigenous universities, historically Latino universities, or historically African-American universities, or otherwise, we have to make sure that frontline communities that are impacted are at the table as part of um, um, as part of the decision making. This is a group of historically black colleges, university um, professors who came together to, to to talk about the research agenda around sustainability. We need to um, make sure that, that we have justice-based energy entrepreneurship focused on energy. Oh, sorry. Yes, yeah, okay. Back on focus on energy efficiency and clean energy, and and, and prioritizing community wellness instead of pro prioritizing profit margins. We need to focus on making models where community own, communities own their energy, and that we have a worker ownership models as well, because it is possible to build wealth in a way, or or even just well-being, without some sacrificing people or our planet in the process. So we need to also make sure that we seize our power to advance a socially responsible and accountable corporate America um, and, and groups like this, which are um, out there protesting around, this is actually in South Africa, um, that we, we need to make sure that we're there holding folks accountable. We need, um, and again, even with a Bank of America, which funds the NAACP, <laughs> but, um, but, but I still, that still doesn't hold us back from holding them accountable for their practices as well. So we need political system change, including campaign finance reform as well. In a country where um, there are communities with double-digit unemployment, millions of people who are homeless, and millions of people who are starving, we can't have another election where billions of dollars are being spent on unproductive smear campaigns. And so we also need, um, and this again is in South Africa, stop the 1% from profiting from pollution. So, and this is a little village environmental justice organization in front of City Hall in Chicago. They successfully shut down two coal-fired power plants after years of action on the pollution from coal plants there. And then, then we need to make sure that we do have campaign finance reform, as I said before, and that we are at the table making sure that people are, are voting in, 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 in our best interest. And then we also need youth leadership because they have the, the voice of wisdom now, but then they'll also inherit the earth and we have a responsibility to be accountable to them as we move forward. So as modeled from Berkeley where this community has grown their own food and has a gray water system and a tool library to the next is the landslide community in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania where they also grow their own food, have a transportation cooperative and they feed in the indigent communities in their area on Wednesdays. Um, we have, oh, back again. <laughs> so we have to, we need to advance these models of local self-reliance and collective community models um, to ensure, because they're essential to ensuring that we have a sustainable planet. So our, our last slide is really just saying that we can do this together by binding together. Um, there's an African proverb that says, when spiders unite, they can tie up a lion. So with common purpose, we can end the blatant purchase of elections, we can end the blatant purchase of, of candidates and judges and key decisions, we can end the proliferation of cancer clusters, and we can end poverty in the land of plenty, and we can end cultural erosion. We can advance justice-based economies, and we can advance healthy and thriving communities, and living together in harmony with Mother Earth, and her air, her water, and her land. So th the question now is kind of, are, is, are we living up to this notion of being a nation? indivisible with liberty and justice
for all. <laughs> Not really, but um, I think with our collective action, we can definitely do it. So thank you. Marcello Federico. Um, I'm from Long Meadow, right on the corner. Um, but anyway, uh, there there has been uh, a number of things uh, in the Colorado region regarding the flooding, regarding uh, the fracking uh, in installations, and so far because of the flooding, there's been over 25,000 gallons of oil contaminating the waters uh, in the region. Uh, just to give an example of constant, you know, uh, uh, battering from, you know. Uh, oil corporations and uh, other uh, conglomerates that are trying to destroy and are destroying the planet uh, constantly and viciously uh, and how you know the people uniting is the real only solution because corporations and governments clearly have no intention of stopping any of these disasters. So that's what I hope we're all here for and to just uh, build off the momentum. Uh, we're going to have again a fantastic lunch uh, later with the Raging Grannies playing and hopefully if, if they uh, decide to show up and uh, the Arise for Social Justice members uh, making our lunch which is fantastic and uh, we thank them. Thank you all. And um, if anyone needs has, or has any questions or needs any help at all to uh, contact uh, the people with the yellow stickers on our name tags because we are the organizers and we can hopefully answer your questions. Um, and uh, Tom and I are going to uh, introduce the workshops that are to be uh, taking place at the moment. Yeah, by all Oh, uh, Tom Taff, I'm one of the organizers. Uh, I'd just like to thank you all for coming here. We have over 170 people here. Thank you very much.